ओम ज्ञान श्रीरंधस्य ज्ञानंजन शलाकय Doctors at the present time in India, especially, uh, tend to be highly respected. Is that correct? Um, did any of you practice in the West at any time? Uh, I worked in the UK for about five years. Is not so much respected in the UK. Some places here. Is it? They do consider them very well. Is it? Yeah. But some places in most places in India they accept of In general um in India there is a still some culture of respect there's a kind of, before there was a caste system and now there's a different kind of hierarchy. It doesn't matter well still caste is there but uh there's different considerations but still there's, there's there's a culture of respect and it works the other way too there's a culture of contempt also <laughs> but in the west it's the democratic ethos means they don't respect anyone they just contempt everyone <laughs> now why i'm mentioning that is um because previously in india in the caste system actually the doctors they weren't rated so highly the vaidya was considered you know, not a very high status so of course the the old caste system there are many problems with that i don't know that is described by our gorya acharyas as the asura varnashram and the act in bhagavad gita lord krishna says charto varnyam maya shrishtam guna karma vibhavasha <coughs> that this system of varna and ashram is actually created by bhagavan himself so it's not inherently bad but the misuse of it is bad. Yeah. Daivi Varnashra means that system in which the different varnas and ashrams cooperate for the glorification and service of Bhagavan. So therefore we find in Shastra statements such as स्वकारमनाथ तमभ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ्यार्थ
Sri Ramanuja himself, he, although born in a Brahmana family, he emphasized the importance of Hari Bhakti, not of simply observing hierarchical status. We find among the Alvas also that Bhagavan himself made an array, made arrangements by which his devotees would be glorified even if they're from a supposedly lower status. So this is the point that in the Daivi Vanashram, our, our Acharyas, our Gorya Acharyas have noted the difference between Daivi Vanasham and Asura Vanasham. Asura Vanasham means simply based on birth, one thinks that a higher position is meant for exploiting others. Whereas the Daivi Vanasham means everyone cooperates to serve Bhagavan Hari. It's a, it's a practical arrangement. Our Srila Prabhupada preaching all over the world would often speak about the Varnashram system in the Western countries where people have no idea of it. And if they have any idea of it, they, they tend to relate to the caste system, which is uh, a perversion. The, the caste system as it was going on until recently, and it's still something like that is still going on in some parts of India, mostly for the sake of uh, oppressing others. But mostly in this part of the, in most of India it's broken down and uh, it, it's only there for marriage and that's also breaking down. <coughs> so Srila Prabhupada would speak about this and he would say it's a scientific division of society because whether you uh, call Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya or Shudra you'll find all over the world there are some kind of people who are intellectual by nature some kind of people who are leaders of society by nature, they, they like to, it's their nature to take charge. Some people by nature are very interested in producing, production and making money. And some people by nature, uh, then they don't have any uh, self, particular self-motivation, they, they just work for someone else, that's all. And they're not particularly skilled. So the Varnashram system is a scientific division of people according to their qualities as Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada also criticized the education system. In many ways he criticized it. They, they tried to train everyone in the same way, but people should be trained differently according to their nature. It's no use to try to train someone who's got no aptitude for it in, in, for instance, mathematics and all kinds of intellectual pursuits, when anyway he's, you know, he's maybe going to be an auto mechanic or a truck driver, better to train him from an early age in, uh, me in uh, mechanics. And actually that was going on until recently, until they made all these rules against child labor. But the child would be better the child is going to be a mechanic rather than sitting in the school not learning things which he can't learn, which he has no aptitude for. If he learns that which he has an aptitude for, which he likes to do, he'll be more content and it's, it's more practical. So anyway, um, these are all points that Srila Prabhupada was making. <coughs> Now the Daivi Vanashram, yeah, it's uh, everyone, this idea is everyone cooperates. The Brahmanas are considered like the head of society. The uh, Kshatriyas like the arms, which protect. The Vaishyas like the stomach, which, res which distributes energy to the rest of the body. And the Shudras like the legs. But although the, among all of these, the head is the most important, because if the head is cut off, you don't need to be a doctor to say what happens to the body. Uh, but it's not that we consider the leg unimportant. 
or the arm is unimportant, or the stomach unimportant. All are required. But in Daivi Vanashram, the emphasis is on spiritual realization. <coughs> Understanding that the purpose of life is spiritual realization. And therefore the Brahmanas were respected. Because of their practical uh, renunciation and spiritual knowledge and ability to guide others on the spiritual path which I I'll come back to the first point I made, that, that doctors weren't so much respected because they were concerned with uh, the body, which is important because if the body is not healthy, then it's difficult to do anything. And unless one is very spiritually advanced, then uh, poor health will make it difficult uh, to pursue spiritual practices, either physically, that you, if you can't move, then you can't go to the temple, or, and or and mentally also, if one has to concentrate the mind on Bhagavan, but the, the mind is disturbed by pain or sickness, then it's very difficult to perform sadhana or any activities of bhakti. So the body is important, but it's not considered, or it's not as important as the soul or spiritual development. So therefore, doctors were not accorded the same kind of status as today when in the modern age the body is considered all important because people have lost their spiritual direction and people are simply interested in sense enjoyment, how we can enjoy the body. So, the, who can who can uh, help to keep the body in shape so that it can go on enjoying? With sensual enjoyment is rated very highly, at least. That's a possible reason. It's probably more complex than that. Society is very complex, but at least this much we can deduce from this. Of course, there are other reasons in the uh, in the Asura Vanasham they put too much emphasis on uh, ritual purity and impurity, not understanding that purity of consciousness is the most important. And so, uh, therefore, the surgeon was considered no cuts because you're dealing in blood. Although in uh, in modern society the surgeon is among doctors the surgeon is considered various types of surgeons are considered more prestigious. And the neurosurgeon is Heart surgeon, and then above that, I think heart surgeon mm -hmm. is the most prestigious, and ab but above him is the neurosurgeon, because without this, you're a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so uh, these two things are essential. I mean, you can get by without without a kidney, or you can cut out half your liver and still go on, or let someone else's liver. Hopefully you'll still go on, but without a heart or a brain, then you fit into the Bhagavad Gita verse, Tata Dehantara Praptihi, as described in Bhagavad Gita. Dehantara changing body. Actually, there's a book uh, of some of Srila Prabhupada's conversations, correspondence, called The Science of Self-Realization. And Srila Prabhupada wrote a letter, it's recorded in that book, in which he... Uh, but actually, he was told by one of his disciples that there was a heart surgeon in Toronto, Canada, who had publicly declared... Well, he didn't use the word spirit or spiritual, but he said, I've seen 
hundreds of deaths. And it seems to me there's something, it's not just a mechanical change that you say, well, the heart function failed, brain waves are zero, respiration stopped, dead. But it's not just that the functions of the body cease, but it seems to me that there's a particular moment where some, something leaves the body. You said something. You say what? But in our language, we say it's the soul. And that's the whole beginning teaching of Bhagavad Gita. There's the Deha and the Dehi. The soul and the body and the soul. And understanding the difference between this is the entrance into spiritual life. So Srila Prabhupada wrote a long letter to him. But yes, actually, it's a fact. Which, if one is a little bit sensitive, he can observe it. And <coughs> it would actually improve the whole uh, profession of medicine if this simple fact were understood. We find in Bhagavad Gita, again, Lord Krishna states, that... Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hridesha Juna Tishtati. That Ishvara is in within the heart of or Hridesha, in the region of the heart of all living beings. Now, often people ask me, this is usually translated as the Supreme Lord is in everyone's heart. So often people ask, then what happens with a heart surgery? If the soul and Bhagavan are within the heart, then when there's a heart surgery, what happens? The soul, then the soul should get transferred from one body to another. But that's not the actual Sanskrit. The, the actual Sanskrit is Hridesha, which means in the region of the heart. It's usually translated as in the heart because it means more or less the same thing. But it specifically says Hridesha, in the region of the heart. So, when the apparatus of the heart is transferred, the soul remains in that region. And actually, Srila Prabhupada also proposed that, you see, the heart is the source of energy for the body. An amazing machine. But where does, it get, where does it get its energy from? What is it that makes the heart beat? Uh, where, what is the actual source of energy in the body? What is it that makes all the different systems within the body interact and work? Or you could say, well, oxygen is the source of energy, but it's not for the... But the, uh, the oxygen also can't do its job unless everything else is in place. So the, the heart is the source of energy. But what is the source of energy for the heart? And that is the soul. As long as the soul is there, the heart goes on beating. When the soul leaves, then mechanically the heart may beat for a short time. Just like sometimes uh, it's, it's seen that a chicken's head is cut off, but still the body flaps for a little time. There's no actual, you can't say that it's alive, but it's some mechanical function is going on. <coughs> so Srila Prabhupada said that the, the, this should be a source of study for scientists. At MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, when he was giving a lecture there, the most prestigious institute of technology in the world, and after which we have MIT and Manipal. <laughs> but the original is in Boston, Massachusetts. MIT. 
So uh, Prabhupada, he pointed out that for all its departments of study, I mean, so many big brains from all over the world, there is no uh, faculty for studying the difference between a living body and a dead body. Why is there not research into this? Well, maybe one reason is because it's just presumed in modern medicine or in modern science in general. There's a presumed mechanistic worldview. That there is, we can only accept as reality that which is perceivable or measurable by the by sense perception. What we can see, what we can perceive, not just see, what we can hear, touch, smell, feel, taste, and ba- hypothesis based on that. This is what is called science. It's a mechanistic outlook. It presumes from the beginning that there is uh, there is nothing spiritual. There's, but this presumption from the very beginning puts a severe limit on the possibilities of understanding reality because it it makes uh, an unfounded and actually unreasonable assumption that all of reality is within the scope of human sense perception and what can be extrapolated from human sense perception. But it's actually much more reasonable to consider that there may be all kinds of areas of reality outside the scope of human sense perception. And of course theories are there of antimatter, for instance. Or the idea that everything ultimately can be explained by numbers. Why? Why should why should everything ultimately the physicists want to explain everything by numbers? But why? Why should everything be explainable by numbers? And I, like I say, it's mechanistic and it actually produces a very uh, crude outlook on life. If we presume there's no spirit, then emotions and pain just are just seen, happiness, pain, they're all seen as just interactions of matter. So just like you can... You can program a machine that if you shine a red light on it, it will say, I see a red light. But it, it doesn't, we know that it's just a machine and it has no actual consciousness or experience of red light. But those with a grossly mechanistic outlook, <coughs> they like to say that when we, when we feel pain, I'm sure as doctors you're, all, you're daily seeing lots of pain, both physical and psychological, emotional. Um, then it's it's just that that pain they like to say it's just a kind of uh, it's just a some kind of reaction of chemicals. So it's a very cold outlook, isn't it? To think that there, there's you, no one's actually feeling any pain. It's just just a Reaction of something going on in the neurosystem is Srila Prabhupada also I, just one point about Srila Prabhupada and his books and his teachings one reason he was uh, so, sex, so successful in spreading this Krishna consciousness in, in the West there are various reasons for that, and one reason is his ability to apply the Vedic knowledge to all kinds of situations and to show that Ved means Ved, because Ved means knowledge. It's not a, a, a Hindu dogmatic or sectarian religion. Just like we say Christian religion, Muslim religion, Hindu religion, but Ved means knowledge. So knowledge should be applicable in all circumstances. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true for a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian. It's The knowledge is independent of anyone's belief system. 
So generally we talk about, we think of Hinduism as being another kind of belief system, but Srila Prabhupada presented that this is Ved, this is knowledge. So he was able to apply, because he understood this principle, that it's not, this is uh, Veda Narayanam Sakshat, this is knowledge coming directly from Narayana. It's not just, it's not someone's dogmatic opinion. So he was able to apply that knowledge in all kinds of circumstances, which if it is actually knowledge, then it should be applicable to the cultural milieu of the West and not just, it's not something Indian. This Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita is not something Indian, it's knowledge. Uh, just like uh, I happened to be present once when there was a, a uh, journalist in London who uh, asked, Srila Prabhupada had a verse quoted from Bhagavad Gita by one of his disciples, who read the Sanskrit. So then the, uh, that's also in that book, Science of Self-Realization, his interview is recorded. So that uh, radio interviewer, Mike Robinson, he asked Srila Prabhupada about the role of the scripture. And Srila Prabhupada gave a very apt example. He was speaking into a microphone. And he said, it's just like when you get a microphone, you get a manual that goes with it, which tells you what it's meant for and how to use it. So he said, in the same way, the Shastra, the Veda, that is knowledge of the creation. What we are doing here and how to utilize this situation for its actual purpose. What is the, it tells us what is the purpose of our existence. Just like what is the purpose of a mic. If you don't know, you might think, well, it's you know, good for hitting someone on the head with. Or maybe you could use it for stirring the dal. You could do all those things with a mic. But it's not the... And if you want to hit someone on the head, there are better things to use than that. Or if you want to stir the dal, there are better things to use than that. In fact, you'll spoil the, the real use of the mic, which is for uh, interacting with the rest of the components to amplify sound. It will be spoiled by doing that. So it tells you what its actual purpose is, and then how to use it to get the, the best effect. So in the same way, the Vedic knowledge is given by the creator of the universe at the time of creation for the point of understanding what we are doing here and how to make the best use of our situation in all ways. That's why we'll find within the Vedic knowledge there are, <coughs> there are all kinds of, uh, apart from the Vedanta, of the Upanishads, which are the spiritual knowledge, and then even beyond that, or, or the complete fruition of the Vedic knowledge is Srimad Bhagavatam. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. This is the actual subject of all the Vedas, is the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, um, apart from that, there are all kinds of directions for how to live in this world. So therefore we find Ayurveda and Vastu Shastra. That's why you had us pointing east. There's a reason for that. And then which direction we should eat in at different times of day and what direction we should sleep in, what time we should sleep in, what times we should eat at. And all these things are given in Shastra to help us <coughs> to uh, maximize the functionality of our bodies and how our bodies interact with everything else within the world so that we can uh, bring to fruition the ultimate goal of life which is to understand that we're not the body at all. We, we enter one body after another but we have to end this punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi janani jaktaraishayanam, and go to the spiritual world. So I was saying that Srila Prabhupada was very 
expert at presenting the Vedic knowledge in uh, terms of modern society and he, just like uh, the heart surgeon, Srila Prabhupada complimented him that yes, by intuition you've come, you've come across uh, an essential fact of existence the, which is described elaborately in Shastra how the or oh, what was I saying about MIT? Yeah, there's no department that shows the difference between living body and dead body. And so, so like this, then Srila Prabhupada, he would also point out the defects. Where, where there's good things, he would say, yes, this is good. When there's something bad or mistaken, he would point out, this is a defect. In You see, you have so many departments of knowledge here at MIT and studying science in so many ways, but you, you don't know the difference between a living body and a dead body, and you're not, you should, you should find out. Otherwise, it's a huge lacuna in your knowledge. Why isn't it there? It's what is the actual nature of life cannot be sufficiently described simply in mechanistic terms. You can say that, well, as long as the uh, heart function is there, the, the various respiratory system and brain functions are there, you can say it's alive. But what is the nature of life? <coughs> it's, uh, it cannot be described in terms of the body alone. One very interesting thing which uh, maybe some of you have had experiences with, it's, it's, it's been documented widely over the last 30 years or so, it's not part of mainstream science, but many mainstream scientists, including doctors, have noted what they call NDEs, probably neurosurgeons and heart surgeons, near-death experiences, where uh, it's, it's a, it seems to be quite a common scenario because there's, it's been reported in various situations all over the world where people die and clinically they're dead. And after some time they come back again and say they come to life again. They're already, you know, signed, sealed and delivered, ready for the for the casket. But then they they just come back to life again. And then they describe some experience. Or, or there are... Uh, this is even much more common, out-of-body experiences. It's very common in surgery. I mean, not very common, but common enough that uh, there are many cases which have been documented in which the uh, a patient, it's, it often happens under anesthesia, deep anesthesia, in surgery, where the person, although he is, you know, unconscious. Afterwards, he describes everything the surgeon was saying and even the jokes he was telling and all this kind of thing. Because he was sitting, ab I mean, he's sitting above the body. The soul goes out of, the soul in the subtle body sits above and can explain everything that was going on. Although they were unconscious. If they'd been conscious, then... Uh, they would have been screaming because of the, the pain. So there, there are various... Uh, there have been certain scientists, or, or in a science... Let's put it this way. In a scientific manner, over, especially over the last 30 years, there have been investigations into many phenomena which are still considered uh, taboo by what are called orthodox scientists. Another one is uh, investigation into reincarnation. There was one Dr. Ian Stevenson who was a psychologist who spent his whole life investigating uh, cases of reincarnation in which it was, uh, he found hundreds of cases, documented cases all over the world where, for instance, a five-year-old girl would talk about her 
husband in another village and they never the people the family would have never heard the village of the village and then they find out that there's some village like 200 miles away and they go there and she names all the people in the family but she looks confused that oh this is the way to this is the way to the room and I say oh yeah well I just it was there but just two years ago we blocked the door so like this there, I mean in many many cases documented like this so it is possible to in in a what we could call a scientific and dispassionate way uh, investigate various phenomena which substantiate the teachings of the Vedas about life and death and rebirth but because of the overwhelmingly uh, mechanistic outlook of modern science in which they they prima facie presume that there can be nothing spiritual uh, there, it's actually a great blockage in the it's like a, a clot which kills the, the true spirit of science that they don't they're, they're like firmly opposed to invest to even admitting that there can be anything spiritual I'm not saying you but it is the in, in what we would call the uh, it's the general stream of mainstream science even though many scientists of various disciplines consider themselves religious or theistic but they'll say things that yeah yeah well I believe in God but as a scientist and then they'll talk something which is completely to against any the theistic strand of thought so uh, yeah Srila Prabhupada was pointing out some of these defects in the in the mechanistic worldview that it it's actually not reasonable to presume from the very beginning that there's nothing spiritual because just because we cannot you can't measure it there's there's no uh, solometer there's so many ometers for measuring so many different types of energy or and there's so many different ways of manage, measuring distance light sound various energies specific gravity and density of liquids and all kinds of things. There are various instruments for measuring, but but the soul, by its very definition, because it's not material, cannot be measured in a material way. So to say that we cannot perceive the soul by any material means doesn't mean that there is no there isn't a spiritual means to attain. You have to find the the right means to perceive it. Just like. Uh, If you bring a ruler to measure light, that's stupid, isn't it? It's for measuring distance, short distances. So, uh, cert there's a certain methodology in every discipline. That's why someone may be the world's best heart surgeon, but you wouldn't want to stick him on a brain surgeon because he knows his area and there's a certain methodology and however brilliant he may be in one area just like Einstein you wouldn't want to call him if Einstein was to reincarnate right here now and there was, there was a need for an urgent brain surgery even though he's the most famous scientist of the modern era you wouldn't want to have him as a he doesn't know anything about it so like that, there there's certain methodologies for various disciplines, and you have to follow the met you have to follow the methodology to become an expert in it. There's a certain process for becoming expert in it. So in the same way, there is a spiritual methodology that is called bhakti yoga, which if it is followed then one can become spiritually realized. And there are symptoms of spiritually realized persons. Just like there's symptoms of a healthy body. 
So symptoms of a the, the symptoms of one who is spiritually advanced. That means he's uh, detached the, from material sense enjoyment and is attached to praising Krishna. That's at the highest level of spiritual realization. Now, uh, of course, understanding these points, it can be... Uh, it, do, it does require some deep investigation, because just like we did, the, the subject of Krishna consciousness is consciousness. So... Consciousness, it it may appear to be, or it is, it has been supposed in science to be a product of matter. Although there are now schools of consciousness studies, which I'm told have necessarily come about because of uh, quantum research, that the, the role of the observer, the consciousness of the observer, has to be factored in. But traditionally in science it's been presumed that consciousness is a result of various uh, conditions of the brain. And it might seem like that. Because, for instance, by administering various drugs, the state of consciousness of the person alters. The drug has an effect on various uh, mechanisms within the brain and thus we have amphetamines and barbiturates and they have you can or in the uh, in the gross language of the Western world, uppers and downers. <laughs> so, all, all we'll see, for instance, uh, there, was, there was someone I knew who uh, was in a, an accident, and uh, afterwards their whole nature, I, I've seen it, I mean, you've probably seen it hundreds of times, and I've seen it, in, at least, in the case of at least two people I know, is that after an accident in which they sustained head injuries, that their nature changed. And in both cases for the worse, actually. So, <clears throat> there appears to be a, a distinct relationship between the brain and consciousness. But Srila Prabhupada explained that the brain is not actually the, the source of consciousness or the, or the vital factor. That consciousness is independent of the brain, but the brain works as a, a machine or, or a, something like you can say like the hardware in a computer. Uh, that's a gross example because a computer doesn't work without any hardware although the consciousness can exist that, that the whole point of what Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita is that the consciousness is not dependent upon the body and this is a very important point because if the consciousness was dependent upon the brain then with, then with the end of the brain function then consciousness would cease to exist but rather the Bhagavad Gita, rather Krishna teaches in Bhagavad Gita that the consciousness is a symptom of the soul which is manifest through the body. But the soul is independent of the body. And when the body dies, the soul, it, it, what, what, we say, what we say by death is not actually the death of the living being, but it means that the living being no longer functions through that apparatus. So there's the, uh, the body and the brain. So the brain is, the, the body is the apparatus for 
eating, walking, defecating, digesting, all these different things. And the brain is the apparatus for uh, thinking, emotions, <coughs> memory, discrimination, sense of uh, right and wrong. But according to the Bhagavad Gita, these are functions that take place that the brain acts as an apparatus but that the intelligence is connected to the soul not to the brain itself because life life is not dependent upon the brain now at that point I was talking about the near death experience and the out of body experience shows that these demonstrate that even though the body is can be technically dead, the person continues to exist independent of the body. Or even though the consciousness is apparently not unconscious in, in deep anesthesia, the person can continue to exist independently. Of, although the... Uh, the person's been put into deep anesthesia, he, he, he continues to uh, perceive everything that's going on around him. So, these are questions which scientifically minded people should take up. As I was saying, there are theistic scientists and doctors all over the world who often make statements like this, that I believe in God, but as a doctor or as a scientist, and then they, they kind of separate in their conscious, uh, in their way of thinking, that, you know, okay, I went to the church or the temple or the synagogue, and here I have my religious hat on. And then when I'm in the hospital, I have my surgeon's cap on. And it's like, you keep the two areas of thinking separate. Emotionally, I believe in God. Scientifically, I act as a scientist. But Srila Prabhupada, I'm saying he was uh, maybe unique in the sense that he presented Krishna consciousness as a science, in other words, as a holistic view of reality in which you, being religious and being scientific are not two different ways of looking at the world, but rather... If Veda is actually knowledge, then it, it's not, like I said, 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's not, not, it's not dependent upon time, place, circumstance, or opinion. It's not that, well, Krishna is a Hindu god because the Hindus think he's a god, and therefore Krishna is a Hindu god. But actually, if there is Bhagavan, which... That's another discussion altogether, but it's grossly foolish not to consider that there is no Bhagavan. Then that Bhagavan is, uh, he's Bhagavan in all times and all places and all circumstances. And we in all, whatever kind of family we may have been, or religious system or irreligious system we may have been, been born into, the fact of his existence and our relationship with, is independent of that. So it's really, it's not a matter of belief or believing, but it's a matter of understanding. This is how Srila Prabhupada presented Krishna consciousness. I'm not going to go on with it much more now because it's a very big topic, but i just like to, uh, or like this, I've discussed the, the possibilities of uh, understanding what is being presented herein in a non-dogmatic manner, that you don't have to say, well, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a believer. You know, we, can, we, can, we should approach this knowledge as... Uh, first of all, there should be some faith there. Um, Arrant skepticism won't help. 
in any area of knowledge. You, you can't become a doctor if you're totally skeptical about medicine. To learn anything, you have to be somewhat humble and respectful. If you... Uh, just like 2 plus 2 equals 4, if the child of being says, Oh, that's all rubbish. I don't believe this. What are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Actually, in one sense, it doesn't make any sense because what is a number anyway? It's just a construct within the mind. But anyway, the point is that uh, one has to be humble and respectful and uh, in the beginning there has to be some faith in any sphere of knowledge, in any discipline. To imbibe the knowledge, you have to have some faith that what is being taught makes sense. If from the beginning you're skeptical, then you, you can't make any progress. No one will want to teach you and your, your mind is completely closed to learning it. So in the same way, with this uh, knowledge that's given in Srimad Bhagavatam, one has to be somewhat open to receive it in the first place. But the defect of the modern so-called scientific outlook is that there is inculcated a, a kind of skepticism of anything beyond that which can be measured, which, as I was pointing out, is not, it's not very intelligent, actually, to, just to presume that all of reality is, with, is measurable by human means because we are very tiny, limited living beings with, with very tiny intelligence, and we have the defects as analyzed in Shastra, Brahm Pramad, Vipalipsa, Karana, Patal. Every human being has the defects of uh, making mistakes. Is there any doctor who can say he never made a mistake? Everyone makes mistakes. To err is human. But to err means we got it wrong. So, uh, to presume that scientists got everything right, I mean, no, no scientist will accept that anyway. I mean, if, if you're actually honest, then you have to you know that there's so many things we, every scientist will admit there's so many things we don't know and so many things we got wrong and now we think we got it right, but quite likely someone will come along and and point out that what we think is right now is also wrong. And then, that's what is taught in school is what was considered right 20, in science is what was considered right 20 years ago. And on the cutting edge of scientific knowledge, what's taught in school now is already out of date. And it's like that. It's always changing, which as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, is not actually knowledge. It means that people have made some hypotheses which, according to what we presently know, seems to be right. But it's, the fact that it's always changing means that we're not actually on the platform of knowledge. So, Brahm, to, to make mistakes, uh, to be an illusion, to the cheating propensity, that's coming out more and more how research scholars they, they have a, like a five year research funding and in the first three months they, fi they find out that the whole thing they're researching it's, it's all wrong it's, it doesn't make any but they, they keep on fudging the figures because they've got five years income so this kind of thing goes on because the cheating propensity is there it may be there also just uh, for the sake of prestige, the, to, uh, to show that one's made a great discovery. One may fudge the figure. These kind of things go on. Brahmapamad, Vipralipsa, Karana Partav, and uh, imperfect senses. We believe what we can measure, but then what is the, how well can we see? And how well do we interpret what we see? So the human defects are there so to presume that everything 
within re- within reality, we can only accept that which we can measure. Well, that's actually one definition of Maya. <coughs> One dictionary definition of Maya is to attempt to measure. And one name of Bhagawan is Apramaya. That there's you can't there's no scientific clinical method of understanding it. There is another method. It's a different methodology by which he can be understood. But if you say, well, we could we didn't find Bhagavan with a ruler or with litmus paper or with in in in, uh, in refraction of light, and we didn't we didn't find him with a hydrometer or a hygrometer or any other ometer, then that show that means he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It just means that there's no material means of understanding him, which is the whole point: is that he's not material. So to say that there's no material means of understanding him doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. It means he exists beyond the range of human, of material perception. But it doesn't mean that there that there cannot be any method of spiritual perception, which is being talked about in Srimad Bhagavatam, where the important name of Bhagavan is given as Adhokshaja, which means that he is by his very nature, he is beyond the sense of mundane adha akshaja. Aksha means eyes. Akshaja means everything. Ja literally means that which is born. So it means everything within the scope of visual perception. And adha in this sense means beyond or above. So by very definition... He never is going to be found by any mundane method. One has to accept the spiritual method, which is heart to heart. The method of cultivating love for Him. Now, as I was saying, in in the holy mechanistic outlook, love is uh, simply (laughs) something that goes on, something that goes on in the brain. So, if you look deeply enough within the brain, maybe you'll find a love cell. Well, maybe you will. But that doesn't explain, even if you do, just like you can, you can find uh, there are certain nerves which, uh, the, the perception within the brain, the, the, the messages which are sent by the nerves, and, you, and that is called pain. But it doesn't really explain pain. You can tell someone and they're experiencing excruciating pain, and you can tell them, "Well, actually, it's just you know the nerve sending a message to the brain." And you can tell them that, but it doesn't really help them very much because the experience of pain is excruciating. So the experience of, according to the Bhagavad philosophy, the experience of love that is. That is also intense, and that is the uh, the goal of life to foster that sense of love. We have to know what is the proper object of that love. The proper object of that love is Bhagawan Hari. There is a method to do that, and by developing that love, that will lift us beyond the platform of pain. We will become qualified to enter the spiritual world, the world beyond pain. There's no pain in the spiritual world. So there is a methodology for developing our fully blossomed sense of love. It's not a material methodology. It's a spiritual methodology, which if one applies himself to it, he becomes fully spiritually realized. But to the person who's totally mundane, it would appear to he, that he's just a sentimental. So, it's up to every individual to decide whether they want to remain on the 
totally the, the, the totally dry outlook of just perceiving everything as matter, or the uh, enlivening outlook of going beyond matter to the spiritual. So, as I was saying, it's some kind of introduction from a how Srila Prabhupada, using this non-technical language, as he would say, I am not a scientist. Actually, he was a pharmaceutical. He was a, how would you say, pharmaceutician, pharmacologist. He was a med- manufacturer of medicine in his secular life before he accepted sannyasa. Is it pharmacologist? No, he was manufacturer. Pharmacist. Pharmacist. Okay. Well, he was manufacturing medicine, so maybe that's different from one who dispenses them. He was manufacturing and selling. So he had some basic knowledge of chemistry, you could say. The prophet said, I'm not a scientist. But he spoke on the principles of science. And he asked his disciple. He, he had disciples who were professional scientists. And he asked them to explain these points in scientific language for the benefit of the scientific community who need to hear all these things in scientific terms. So I'm speaking from the platform that Srila Prabhupada spoke of, that of a layman in science, speaking on uh, certain principles of how science can be actually immensely benefited by not trying to give, uh, by, by knowing its limits and not trying to explain all of reality. It has its place, but it's not all in all. All right, I'll finish. Hare Krishna. Sorry for coming so late. We had a packed up program all day. And I have asked for my lady. Yes, please do so. I won't go into much background, direct question. Creator created this world. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And Creator wants this world to continue as per His key. Uh, the question comes after the premise. Yes. Correct. So this is the premise. Therefore, therefore let me uh, add. Well, this, this premise needs a little modification. The premise that you said... Go ahead. The premise will be clear. All right. And uh, (coughs) it is defined in our Shastra that ultimate aim of human body is to attain salvation as he becomes self-realized. Yeah. If that happens, will the Original schemes of the Creator will be taken to save you. Why? Well, the, this, this question is often asked that what happens if everyone becomes self realized? Yes, the world, I don't want the world, to say in those words. The world will stop. Yes, you have that. The world will stop. Well, in the second premise you offered, that the, the Lord wants the world to go on according to His scheme. The answer is yes and no to that one. (coughs) Uh, This world is compared to a prison house for the jivas who are not willing to submit themselves to Bhagavan, which is their constitutional position, in which they can be fully happy like that. So the material world is is a... complex prison created by the Lord for the jivas 
to act out their fantasy of there being no Bhagavan and their fantasy of Ishvara Hamaham Bhogi, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, of thinking themselves in control. There's no controller. Jagad, you see, this atheistic philosophy is nothing new. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes atheistic people who say, Asatyam apratishtamte jagadahura nishvara. Atheistic people say there's no ultimate reality, there's no God in control. So they like to think, I am the controller and I am the enjoyer. And they come to the prison house and they say, there's not a prison. You can go anywhere you like. Well, you can't go anywhere you like. You can't do anything you like. And we are bound by janma mrityu jaravya adhi, birth, death, old age and disease. We are bound by satta raja tamagun. So this world is like a prison house. The example is there. It's just like the government, they build a prison house. Actually, I went to prison three days ago. I did a program in a prison in Goa. <laughs> so uh, the government builds a prison and it conducts the prison according to its rules. But they don't really want a prison. The prisoner is the prison is there for the inevitable misbehaved people. So, this world is going on according to God's plan, yes, but it's really due to the misuse of independence of the jivas. The love is all. It means that Bhagavan, he is... Rasaman, Raso Vaisaha. He interacts with the jivas out of love. But love means to choose to love and serve someone. That, that much independence the jiva has to choose to serve Bhagavan or forget Bhagavan. He gives that much independence. If there was no independence, then there would be no love. If, if, if everyone, if people offered, in the spiritual world, if people offered food or offered arati to Bhagavan, just, if they were just programmed to do that, then it wouldn't be any fun, would it? You could probably, uh, you know, have a robot as a wife, but who wants a robot as a wife? You could, you could get someone, you get a machine to cook the idlis. And you could maybe even get, a, a, because in family life there's some kind of rasa, sometimes the husband and wife have a little quarrel, and it's kind of adds some mirchi or something to the, to the family life. It's kind of fun. Although it's apparently not fun, but actually it's fun. So, not maybe not quarrel, but just say, oh, you're always coming home late, and like this. But it's a kind of fun exchange between the husband. So you could probably program a robot to do that also. But there wouldn't be any fun in doing that, would there? If you had a robot wife saying, oh, why did you come? The, ro- the robot wife is programmed that when... When you come in at 11 o'clock at night, so then it, it, the clock inside the robot says, Oh, why are you coming so late? But it's just like that machine I was saying. You can, you can program a machine to say, I see a red light, when a red light is shown on it. But it does, there's no consciousness of it actually seeing a red light. Even, even though it says, I see a red light. We, we know it's when you shine a machine on the, when you shine a red light on the machine that's programmed, to do that, it says, I see a red light. But there's no, there's no person. So in the same way, Bhagavan can program the jivas just to do what he wants. But there's no fun. There's no love. So in the same, in the same way, yeah, for this reason, the jivas are given independence. They can serve him or not serve him. And if they serve him, that's love. And if they don't serve him, they don't want to serve him. They want to forget him. So they come to this material world, which is like a prison house. So yes, it is running on according to God's direction. 
But it's, he doesn't really want it, which is why he comes to this world. To tell us, hey folks, it's a lot better in my place. Why don't you come over there? There's just a few rules you have to follow. You have to submit yourself to me. Ma me kam sharanam raja. So uh, the question, well, what would happen if everyone surrendered to him? Well, they won't. Because some people don't. They don't want to. They're stubborn. They don't want to. If they did, it would it'd be nice. Then we could close down the prison. The government doesn't really want to keep the prison open. But the prison is... Just like if, if the government builds a new city, sometimes in some kind like Brasilia was constructed as the Chandiga was constructed. There are new cities. Gurgaon, I guess. It was, it previously it was Gurgaon. Now it's Gur traffic jam. It's uh, big buildings. And, uh, so... Uh, but when, you, when they build a new city, they also build a prison. That doesn't mean they're thinking, ha, we're going to catch some people and throw them in the prison. But they know that if you have a city of, you know, a few lakh people, that there's going to be a few among them who uh, would be better on the inside of the prison than the outside, because they're antisocial elements. So they build a prison, because they know someone's going to misbehave. <laughs> so... I hope that answered your question. We're all prisoners, you see. The doctors are... Uh, we're all criminals in this way. The doctors are high-class criminals. Yes. Body is a machine. Body is a machine, yeah. Amazing machine, isn't it? It's a machine. It, but it is, isn't it amazing? I mean... No, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, really, if someone is open-minded, they would see that even a, even a single cell is so complex that uh, you know. It, 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 why don't you see that? It must take a great intelligence to make that. It's, it's when I was at school in the biology class, you'd laugh at this. They said they said that the the cell is a very simple organism. And uh, within 20 years, it uh, will be able to make cells from uh, raw matter. And then, uh, you know, when I was in school, that was like 35 years or something. And, uh, well, now they found out it's not as simple as they thought. Probably at the time they were teaching it, they, they, like I was saying, whatever they teach, it's 20 years out of date. So even the simplest cell, what to speak of brain cells? Well, that's another thing I was reading recently, that, that, that uh, neurologists, they're not really sure how the brain works. It's only a theory that impulses are transferred from one cell to another, but it's not really proved. I, mean, I, I saw this in a scientific magazine. They're not really sure if that... If, I mean, that's the theory, but they're not really sure if that's true. So, it's, it's incredibly complex. I mean, even the simplest cells are very complex, and how they all interact with each other, and how all the different... the, you know, the respiratory system, the lymph system, the, yeah. how it all interacts. It's uh, incredibly complex. So, it's actually incredibly stupid to think that there's no intelligence behind all this. The idea that it all came into being by chance is the most fantastic mythology and that people teach it as science. I mean, I think in future, people are going to look back and they're, they're going to think it's like some kind of... Just like um, we laugh now when people, when they talk of, we hear about Christopher Columbus he faced a mutiny from his sailors because they said, we're not going to sail any further west. We're going to fall off the edge of the world. So we laugh when we hear this, the idea that the world is flat and 
People used to think that the world is flat and if you sail far enough you'll fall off the edge. Niagara Falls is nothing. It's, uh, so we laugh when we say in future people are going to they're going to make how could people think that? That they, they, that uh, life has come into being simply by chance combination of chemicals. It's, a, it's such an absurd theory. But the people, it's hotly defended. It's considered unscientific not to believe that. Even though there's, uh, there's not even the slightest shred of actual scientific proof of it. I mean, just like Prabhupada was saying in MIT, that what is the difference between a living body and a dead body? Why don't we find out? Why isn't there a research department to find this out? There are research, there's AIDS research, cancer research, and even they studied some malaria research, although they weren't that much bothered about it because it's only third world people who die from malaria. So uh, there wasn't much in malaria research, even though lakhs of people, maybe crawlers, suffer from malaria every year, and it's a horrible disease. Well, every disease is horrible. <coughs> but why is there no death research department? You want to stop AIDS because you want to stop people dying. You want to stop cancer because you want to stop people dying. But why don't you, why don't scientifically investigate the nature of death and stop it? Stop the whole thing, and you won't need a separate AIDS research, cancer research, and Parkinson's disease research, and this. Just have a death. Just make put it all under one umbrella: death research. My supposition is that, that this is not being attempted because deep down inside, scientists know that it's, the nature of death is uh, beyond their scope to stop. Because it's because the nature of life is not simply mechanical. The fact that there is no death research department, despite the you know, billions of dollars that are spent every year in various kinds of research, there's no no one even thought to have a department to investigate how to stop death, suggests that in, intrinsically scientists understand, although they may not admit it, that the nature of life and death is beyond their scope of perception or manipulation. So, indirectly, they're admitting the need of theology. <laughs> yes, please tell me. I will just know, since we say that the body is a machine, Suppose we do have a machine. All right, you're right. it's coming to the body. Yeah, yeah. And we 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 see through it. Oh, that's that, that's that's another so point. To be in the machine, the, the difference should be manufactured in a factory. So we we understand that. Well, uh, as we yeah, as you were saying that uh, the, the 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 world is being managed by God, so He has His systems of doing things. You can put in, you know, there are now artificial limbs and artificial organs. But uh, there's no artificial yeah, life. Very, very, uh, fantastic computer. Uh, it's all but, uh, so it well, it, 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 yeah, that, the, uh, the computers they can uh, they can beat the chess grand, the best the best chess grandmasters in the world. The computer, which is programmed by a human being, can be programmed to defeat the world chess champion. That's already happened. But does that mean, and now there's another whole area, artificial intelligence, does that mean that the computer, well, it duplicates the thought process of the chess player, because the chess player sees the various possibilities in advance. So, the, actually, playing chess, it's, uh, although it requires high intelligence, 
it is a, a kind of logical, mechanical intelligence. But it doesn't, chess doesn't deal with the emotions. The same example. Um, you can program a machine that if you, if you bang it with a hammer, it will say, ouch. That doesn't mean it feels any pain. So, uh, you can program a computer to have intelligence, but it does, it will, but you can't program it to feel emotions. And that is the difference between the robot wife and the real wife. The robot wife might wash your laundry better. Wives nowadays, they don't know. The maid always used to do it, now it's the washing machine. So, the, or the, the robot wife, you never know, they, they, could, they might be able to be programmed to cook idli samba better than your own wife. But, however much you congratulate, hey, that's really great samba, the, the machine wife can say, well, thank you very much, but it can be programmed to say that. But there's no actual exchange of feeling. So that's what's missing. But the problem is many of these are the Puranas, they talk about trees and souls, they talk about stones oh, yeah. and souls. Because where there is life, and, uh, where there is life, there is the presence of the soul. Stones, stones. That's why, and, that's why a, a, a baby is stillborn. It's the same body, it has all the apparatus for growing, but it doesn't grow. Because the soul has left during childbirth. The body either grows or rots due to the presence or non-presence of the soul. The same body, which if you kill, is a murder case. If you, if you take someone and burn them to death, that's a murder case. So if someone, you burn them to death. But the same person, if he dies a natural death, 24 hours later, then if you don't take that body for burning, the same body, that's also a crime. To burn the same body, if you burn it, that's a crime. Then 24 hours later, when he dies a natural death, if you don't burn it, that's a crime. So what's the difference? It's the presence or non-presence of the soul. As long as the soul is there, the body functions. As long as the, when the soul goes, it starts to rot. What about souls being inanimate objects? There are we, like, we talk well, about you say there are souls in... There are some... Yeah, this, the story in Ramayana, yeah so there are... Stone stone being, you know, well, there are souls in some stones, stone. not in every stone. It, it may enter a stone also. But that is, um, but the with the with the presence of the soul is consciousness, and we see the the uh, there is birth, growth. There there are six stages described in Shastra. There there is birth, growth, uh, some period of stability. Uh, Production of byproducts in the in the form of other of children, and then dwindling and death. But in the in the case of a stone, well, some stones do grow. That's also documented. But uh, in general, the consciousness is very much covered. The soul may be there, but that's. That's a punishment, actually, for the soul to be put in such a condition. It's a very covered condition. It means the consciousness is very... The consciousness is almost completely dormant. But it is described in Shastra that uh, that some mountains are conscious. Just like Parvati means the daughter of Parvat Maharaj, who's also known as... Uh, Himava, so Himala. So s some mountains are said to be conscious. And they may exist in more than one form also. Just like Ganga exists as a river and exists as a goddess also. 
So that's also possible. And uh, naturally, people living in a village, they sense the spirit, the spirits of various trees, like this. They sense the, the spirit of the river. There's, at the very low level of religion, there's worship of Gramya Devatas and spirits of, of trees and rivers. So they're also that's also there. Everything in nature is has uh, consciousness. Therefore, we find there's the, the the god of the ocean, the ocean personified. So trees, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, good. We welcome. You believe in Lord Krishna? Yeah. You believe in Hindu religion? No. Word or word? No, word, 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 word. no but actually, actually, again, the premise is mistaken. We, we, you Let see. Me finish, sir. Let me finish, sir. Yeah, but okay, you can finish, but the premise is mistaken. So then. One second, sir. Yeah. I'll just say one thing. Except Hindu religion. No religion is said to be mythology. Nobody calls Quran Sharif as mythology. Nobody calls Bible as mythology. Nobody calls Guru Granth Sahib as mythology. Only Hindu system of sect of this puja is said to be mythology. That, word over why? Well, that's because and people are accepting and repeating. It's, it's that's because religion. of the British. I don't call it mythology. Mythology. No, you use the word mythology. Just the Hindu mythology is for it. I use this word uh, two minutes before I'm sorry to say so. Really? This in what in context? The word, you use, that's why I point out. I'm sorry, I don't I really don't remember okay. saying that. No, I don't want to ask you, I don't want to ask It's not my habit to say so. I just so. want to know I don't accept it. it's being used by word over. Why it is singled out religion, which is said to be based on myths and known as mythology? Word over. Well, again, uh, we don't call ourselves Hindu specifically. Hindu is a, is a word which was given by Muslims. It's not in Shastra. The term mythology, it's, uh, it, it actually comes from the Greek myth, which comes from the Sanskrit mithya. Mithya means yeah. wrong. Mithya means wrong. False. Which is false. False. Yeah. But why this word is specifically... The British... The Hindu British... Hindu mythology. The British... This is also documented. They... Uh, they had the idea, medieval Europe had the idea that Christianity is all in all. And that those who are not Christian, they're heathen. When they came to India, they found a, uh, a highly advanced philosophical theology which actually makes Christianity looks pretty uh, childish and stupid actually I mean I mean there are some very serious problems in Christian mythology if you want to call it that I don't want to call it anything the, I, I mean, uh, standard Christian theology is that because someone, you know, our, our great, 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 great grandfather ate an apple, therefore that's the cause of all human suffering. They also say, anyway, um, there's no actual information of God or how he created the world. Or it, it just, it's actually just dogmatic. They say you just have to believe it. And they, they came in contact with a very sophisticated system of philosophy. And they deliberately made a plan to deprecate it. And one of the... to make it look stupid. And so they said, oh, what is all this rubbish, elephant-headed gods? Although in the Bible they have God appearing as a burning bush. And... Uh, why, again, why that there, there cannot be... Because we didn't see a person with an elephant face doesn't mean that there's nowhere in the universe there's no one with an a human body and elephant face. 
But rather than uh, honestly coming to fa- face to face with the philosophical challenge and uh, being willing to accept that actually there is more sophisticated knowledge in the in the Vedic literature, they instead made a deliberate plan. The, the actually the uh, the study of Sanskrit was begun in Oxford University with the specific purpose of. Uh, showing the inferiority of the Hindu system of religion, as they called it. And Hindus have accepted these terms. Idol, they also use the word idol, which is a, for Murti or Sri Vigra. An idol is actually a, it's a pejorative term. Idolatry. It means worship of something which is... Uh, there's no, there's nothing actually there, but people worship it out of foolishness. So Hindus have unwittingly accepted the, the this deprecatory language, and I don't, I don't know how you heard that because I don't talk about any newspaper, any discussions. Word over, whenever I read, I go to the... Well, there's a whole program. Everybody quotes Hindu mythology. Yeah. Not, never I have heard any this type of derogatory word like mythology. Well, any other religion well this is word. another topic actually. Uh, it's not really been the source of my lecture this evening. But uh, it is quite amazing how Hindus are so tolerant of, of, the, uh, of the deprecation of their belief system. I am vocal, sir. I always And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing that pr- probably in, India must be the only country in the world in which the majority institutionalized, the, I mean, we talk about oppressed minorities, but Hindus are an oppressed majority, which is ridiculous. But anyway, like I say, it's not really the topic. But... You see, this can be overcome by scientific presentation. Srila Prabhupada always presented... He didn't go to the West and tell people to become Hindus. He presented that this is genuine spiritual knowledge that transcends all sectarian boundaries. That this culture is the best culture for God-realization, which is why people took it up. People are looking for the truth. It, it, it's not that uh, Westerners wanted to pick up a flag and say, Garv se ho ham Hindu hai. Or Wahipur mandir banengin. It is not for that purpose that they came to this. It's because they found that what in uh, Christianity was, was not given. The, because people have scientific education in the modern age. And they, because of this scientific presentation, they were convinced by that. And not just by the presentation, but by the experience, by the purity of Srila Prabhupada in his whole way of life, uh, they were convinced by that. So, actually to promote this culture, rather than... But actually by accepting that this is Hindu dharma, we're, it's actually falling into a trap. Because it's not Hinduism. We should be presented that this is... Factual spiritual knowledge, which if people are serious to understand, it can be demonstrated to be superior to all other systems. And when we say it's superior, is not to, to show that we're the best and you're useless, but rather to, to share this invaluable knowledge with others for the sake of their uplift. If we, if we say to the Christian, that very good, you believe in God, now here's Here's some knowledge by which your belief in God can become can improved. If it, this should be presented, but if we say Hindu, then we then you know we fall into the Hindu box, and we got to make we got to make uh, enemies of the Muslims and en- enemies of the Christians, and it just becomes as it becomes a sectarian belief instead of a scientific presentation presentation for the uplift of the soul. Therefore, we are not Hindu fundamentalists. <laughs> we are more of an Indian world. We are everything. Yeah. 
But you, uh, why tolerate your own degradation? There, there should be education in spiritual values. Bhagavad Gita should not be banned from the schools. Christian conversion is going on. Because, there are various reasons for that. One reason is because, one thing is, the, uh, the so-called uh, Hindu swamis, they're mostly, they're just promoting themselves. Instead of uh, giving actual spiritual knowledge to, by which people can be benefited, and another, I mean, what's going on is uh, absurd, actually. I mean, mostly Hinduism more and more is becoming like this uh, self-promoting cult. There are so many people claiming to be Bhagawan. And so you'll find the pictures of all, all these different various gurus posted everywhere. It's self-promotion. And it's actually very shallow. And... Uh, People who want to know, or, I mean, there are various reasons. It's, it's a complex thing. But uh, we're also not much in favor of Christ, this conversion to Christianity because it doesn't actually help people spiritually. They just, they become envious of, of uh, Krishna and Rama and Ganesh and, and uh, they become blasphemous and they eat cows, which uh, most Hindus still don't, although many are beginning to do so. So it's, it's actually a step down from the Vedic culture, but the Vedic culture is not being presented properly. If it were presented properly, uh, then uh, why should people leave it? If they're actually getting something better, then why should they go for something lower? So the real, the real way to uh, preserve this culture is to actually follow it and teach it for the benefit of others with the, with the spirit of uh, Vasundhaiva Kutumbakam. This sectarianism is also not part of what you call Hindu Dharma. It's difficult in an age where people are so much uh, sectarian. It's difficult not to fall in that trap of becoming a Hindu pitted against a Muslim. But it doesn't really serve the cause of Vedic culture to to, to uh, fall into that kind of fundamental